My name's Lisa. Um, I am, and always will be, very proud to say I was one of six. I was always happy being part of a big family. My two brothers and three sisters were my absolute heroes. Being the youngest, they called me by lots of nicknames. Um, mostly I was known, affectionately I hope, as the runt, as in uh, the smallest of the litter. Um, I really didn't mind that too much. Um, so in that photo you can see I'm the littlest one in there with all my good brothers and sisters. As the years passed, we were all scattered all around the world, um, but we always got together whenever it was possible. Um, nothing made my mother and dad happier than having us all together around the table. And then when children and grandchildren came along, they were even happier still. In 2012, I got a phone call. The kind of call that just makes you shiver and the world stops spinning. My big sister Angela had collapsed while on holiday in South Africa. And within moments she died. No warning, no explanation, she just collapsed. There was a defibrillator to hand, medically trained people there, even a surgeon who just happened to be there, I'm not sure what, what kind of surgeon, but actually nothing could be done, she was gone. Angela, that's Angela there, and that's me and Angela when I was little. Um, she was very fit, looked after her health. She left home to become a nurse when I was very young and worked in Australia for many years before meeting the love of her life and moving to Holland. She always sent beautiful letters and recorded cassette tapes telling me stories of her adventures. As a child, I couldn't wait to receive these and looked forward to her visits home. Andrew enjoyed miles of walking with her husband and they travelled the world together. <clears throat> I'd spoken to her just a few days earlier on her 64th birthday. I remember serenading her with that very famous Beatles song. <laughs> the initial assumption was that she suffered a heart attack, but that didn't sit well with me. <laughs> Over 20 years ago, both my children were diagnosed with a connective tissue condition. It outwardly affected their muscles and joints and caused prolapses and random dislocations. All the serious neuromuscular childhood disorders were gradually ruled out. And due to my own musculoskeletal issues, it was a diagnosis of assumption and exclusion. Lots of physio and support for a great paediatric occupational therapist over the years, and she had the determination on both their parts, means you actually wouldn't even know anything about it today when you see them. Um, back then, they called it Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome Type 3 or sometimes benign joint hypermobility syndrome, more recently hypermobile EDS. The label was often more of a liability than an asset, so we just got on with it. Um, there was no genetic test for this particular type of EDS. Um, more recently, there's been some strict clinical guidelines agreed, um, a list of boxes that, as a family, we ticked. So over the years, a few things featured in the wider family um, like excessive bruising, multiple hernias, periodontal issues, bendy, unstable joints, squishy skin, spinal problems, but nothing you'd really dwell on too much or sort of put all together. I had conversations around some of these things with other family members, but I never really pushed the topic. I'd heard of aortic issues with some types of EDS, but it wasn't something particularly associated with hypermobile EDS. And when Angela died, I found myself going back to those family conversations and wondering if it wasn't so benign. A subsequent post-mortem for Angela identified type A thoracic aortic dissection and aortic rupture. There was a second tear further along her aorta, which they weren't sure whether it was a continuation of the original tear or whether it was something that happened during the resuscitation attempts. At a routine rheumatology appointment sometime after Angela died, I remember asking if aortic rupture could be something that might run in our family. I was told not to concern myself about it. It was probably purely coincidental. I was told there was no point in worrying about it in any case. Nothing could be done to prevent aortic recession and there was absolutely no treatment. Of course, I was fearful that the same thing could happen to my children or my other siblings. 
So I was more fearful about sounding like I was overreacting or causing unnecessary stress to the rest of the family. I regret that now. In 2017, I was working in Winchester when I got another one of those dreaded calls. My dear niece told me to sit down and I just knew immediately I'd lost another sister. My world fell apart. Every family has their grounding rock. Kirsty was that person. That's Kirsty there. And again, me with Kirsty when I was little. She was the gentle, funny one who, by luck and geography, hosted most of our family get togethers over the years. She cared for our parents in her their twilight years and she loved my children like her own. Kirsty had not long had her 58th birthday. She spent that day looking after her much loved grandchildren and had handed my baby great niece back to her mum only minutes before she died. I'd passed Kirsty's house earlier in the afternoon and our last conversation had been about whether I dropped in on the way home or the next day. Ironically, I was only 10 miles away the moment she died. On that day, Kirsty made a cup of tea when her husband came home from work and then went upstairs to have a relaxing bath, having looked after the kids that day. Her husband was alerted by a very strange gurgling sound and he went upstairs to find her losing consciousness. My brother-in-law is an experienced first aider and despite his quick action, along with rapid input by the paramedics who were there in minutes, um, and the neighbour, they were not able to resuscitate my sister. And um, um, she died before she arrived at hospital. Kirsty's post-mortem identified a rupture of the aorta, type A once again. Her cause of death was recorded as hemopericardium, aortic rupture, and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. But no type of EDS was actually specified. There was also some atherosclerotic disease noted as well. <laughs> a few days after losing Kirsty, I was due to attend a long anticipated um, appointment at University College London Hospital's hypermobility clinic. And having waited a long time for this appointment, I didn't know whether to cancel it or not. But despite being an emotional wreck, I did decide to go for it. I'm glad I did. As a result of this timing of my own clinical features, I was referred to a geneticist at the Ailes Downloss Diagnostic Service at Northwick Park. And I was also referred for an echocardiogram at my local hospital. <coughs> the echo found dilation of my ascending A all the time, particularly around the side of the tubular junction, and some mild leakage in all my half valves. A subsequent cardiac MRI confirmed this um, sinus effacement and also a bovine arch configuration. I've been scanned locally by a card cardiologist every one to two to two and a half years now, and since then only insignificant growth um, and nothing symptomatic from what I would do otherwise, so I wouldn't have known anything about it. The genetics team at Northwick took full family history um, and gave me advice regarding surveillance and testing of first degree family members and also liaised directly with their specialists. Sadly, no tests were carried out on Angela or Kirsty's um, material to establish any genetic cause for their ruptures. No tissue was kept, so it wasn't possible at a later date either. Two of my surviving siblings were also found to have dilation of the ascending aorta at the same place, the sinotubular junction in particular. After about five months, my genetic tests came back with a variant of unknown significance, a VUS on the FBM1 gene. I know some members here with Marfan syndrome will have a mutation on this gene. A VUS means that it can't be currently confirmed or disproved that the change is responsible for our aortic issues. It could be part of the normal variation that just makes us all different from each other, or it could turn out to be relevant when more is understood about this variant. I'm aware that the more conditions that are tested for when they do gene panels, the more likely they are to find a VUS. So again, it's something I don't read too much into. My surviving sister and I were recruited to the 100,000 Genomes Project in 2018. This is a huge long-term research project mapping the genome of many people with the aim of providing a source of data for research into rare diseases and cancers. 
As Norfolk Park had ruled out the genetic mutation for type 4 A in the stand loss, that's a vascular EDS, which again, people, some of them might be seeing people in the room here if they're aware of that. Um, because they didn't find it, I've now been discharged by their geneticists, and myself and my now grown up children continue to be managed for Ehlers Danlos type 3. And the initial findings of the 100,000 genomes didn't provide any answers for us, although I'm assured the data will be looked at again in the future. And as there's no pathogenic variants identified in my genetic uh, material, my children have not been offered genetic testing. To date, we've got no conclusive results to explain the underlying cause of the aortic deaths and the dilation of surviving function than it was aortas. One of my family members has had much more significant growth than the last year and is awaiting further testing. We're all on medications to maintain acceptable blood pressure and between the whole family, there are varying intervals and modalities of imaging, depending on where they live and availability of things like CT and MRI scanners. Um, but the, at the very least, they're having um, echoes done. Within current criteria, Angela's death, which was over the age of 60, wouldn't have made us eligible for genetic testing. And the in initiation of imaging was also not deemed necessary under existing guidelines. It took Lees and Kirsty and Angela for us to get to a point of imaging and preventative medical intervention like blood pressure control. Um, <clears throat> I'm reassured that those of us primary relatives who want to be checked have been given imaging and testing and also in the preventative drug protocol. Um, and there are a few of our secondary relatives that have also been able to access this. Um, but again, it depends on where you live and who you're under. Um, some of my family members and chosen not to undergo any testing or imaging. And again, that's a personal choice. Um, the whole topic of genetic conditions is a really difficult path to tread, even in the closest of families. Um, and I found myself as a central point for inquiries, filling out lots of consent forms to share my own information, passing along specialist advice and letters to and from various family members. One of the things that came up a lot was worries about access to and affordability of life and travel insurance. Um, and that was the reason why quite a few people didn't use one to go testing. I studied some genetics as part of my degree many years ago. Um, and my experience of going through the diagnostic odyssey with my children's hypermobility helped me somewhat. But largely, I felt like I was learning as I was going along and I was having to find out what I needed to know by really being quite sort of um, inquisitive. Um, even other medical professionals, such as orthopaedic surgeons and anaesthetists, expected me to know exactly what the diagnosis was and if it was genetic. Um, otherwise, I felt like they were implying I was neurotic when I mentioned the family history. Um, the expectations of conclusive results, understanding what's meant or isn't meant by the US, and concerns about the consequences of finding something all had to be explained many times over to others and to even extended family members. I've been very careful to respect each individual's decisions and very discreet with their information and questions. If I'm honest, at times, I felt like I had the world on my shoulders. Some kind of guilty knowledge which I should not withhold, <laughs> but if revealed, would open a Pandora's box that just couldn't be closed again. During the pandemic, I found myself with so many unanswered questions and that access to routine appointments ceased. I spent more time wondering the internet and social media support sites. My dad always said, you have to kiss a lot of frogs to find your prince. And I think finding information on the internet is a bit like that. Um, eventually, I happened upon Aortic Dissection Awareness UK and Ireland. And uh, through their Facebook buddy groups, I discovered I'm not the only person who's in this boat. I also found that people can and do survive aortic dissection, and I'm really chuffed to have met lots of them in this room. Um, and that if it's picked up early enough, there's stuff can be done about it. And that people even survive rupture. So, you know, it's, it's amazing and how quickly it's coming along as well, what, what's possible now. Um, and also how important it is knowing what the cause is because that can determine how it's managed. Um, I think the thing I found out that hit me most um, was that although the individual things that cause aortic dissection, the conditions are quite rare, 
aortic dissection as a whole, um, it's more common than, or people dying from aortic dissection, it's more common than road traffic accident deaths in this country, which I found absolutely astonishing. Um, yeah, that just really brought it home to me. So, my worst fear is getting another one of those calls. I needed to know that I could do all I reasonably could to prevent that from happening to the rest of the family. And that's my family, that yeah. my children and my husband. Since joining Aortic Dissection Awareness UK and Ireland, I've been given so many opportunities. I was part of the team that wrote the patient guide and have had many chances to take part in and influence research, both into the aortic dissection of treatment, but also into patient experiences. I'm especially grateful to aortic dissection awareness um, for allowing me to represent them on the Decide to Add steering group, where I'm assisting with an amazing research project led by Leicester University. The project aims to design and evaluate the decision support tool that will define the treatment choices provide access to key information and empower relatives of patients to make decisions about the screening that reflect their values and priorities. Like a lot of other people involved in this project, I believe that this will increase the uptake of screening and early detection of thoracic aortic disease and address some of the health inequalities in some of the underserved groups amongst us. Such a tool would have been so helpful to me and my family. I feel very strongly about providing support to families losing a loved one to aortic disease. There's so many unanswered questions you're left with. Being able to talk to others who've been there and being able to find reliable information in an understandable format um, is something that's much needed. Um, so I'd like everyone to watch this space for another project that um, Aortic Awareness are working on with Tim Deeming, who's here somewhere today. He was here earlier. It's a wave, Tim, if you're still here. Oh, there we are. He's hiding at the back. <laughs> um, so Tim's a partner with Tease Law and also a deputy assistant coroner. Um, so we're working on a guide for three families. Um, so I'm truly grateful to be involved with such a wonderful patient centred charity and all the families, carers, researchers and medical professionals who are prepared to think aorta, think family. I'm going to leave you with another poignant lyric from one of the Beatles, which my sister Angela particularly loved. Maybe I'll hear you having the tune later on when you work out the song it's from. Life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. This is for Angela Latin Fogarty, October 1948 to October 2012, and Kirsty Goodall, February 1959 to March 2017. And Phyllis Lee. Thank <laughs> you.